Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. On today's show, we're joined by Lynn Hunsaker, Chief Customer Officer at Clear Action, a customer experience transformation consulting firm and the author of the book, Innovating Superior Customer Experience. Lynn has led cross-organizational employee engagement in customer experience excellence as an executive in Fortune 2500 companies. And today we're going to be chatting a bit about CX. So Lynn, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I suppose to begin with, could you give us a sense of your career journey up until this point and how you got into this whole space? Well, interestingly, I started out in strategic planning and I was interviewing customers face to face uh, around the, the North American continent and trying to understand how do they see our performance versus expectations versus competitors and overall value. And uh, we called that relative perceived quality surveys. We actually use that in our strategic planning formula, which I think is uh, not very common even today, which is probably a travesty. And uh, a couple of years into that, they asked me to lead a company-wide task force to figure out our customer satisfaction methodology. So that's where I learned a lot about customer experience, customer satisfaction, loyalty, and so on. And um, I was actually a speaker at the second annual customer satisfaction conference uh, by the AMA and ASQ in 1992. So that gives you an idea <laughs> of how long I've been in this field. <laughs> Uh, So then I went on to be voice of the customer manager in a semiconductor company and uh, became head of corporate quality within about four years and led company-wide transformation, saving millions of dollars and hours for our customers. Every every, uh, P&L had at least two action plans for improving customer experience, which is also a rarity today and something that I'm trying to reinstill. Um, what is it about the space that kind of interests you or, or you know, c- keeps it exciting? Well, I think that this is really a huge source of improving the world. You know, we have so much confusion or time wasted or, you know, uh, kind of negativity that's unnecessary. If we can figure out as organizations, both profit, nonprofit uh, uh, and, and government, how to close the gap between what customers expected Mm -hmm. and what they got. We could save tremendous amount of time and uh, instill a lot more positivity in the world. That's a great answer. I love that. Um, So I'd love to chat a bit about your book, um, Innovating Superior Customer Experience. Um, What motivated you to want to write on that particular area? Yeah, so I was in Silicon Valley in uh, Northern California for a long time. And after I left my corporate job, I still went to a lot of uh, American Marketing Association meetings, business marketing, product marketing, you know, all, all the types of things that had anything to do with customer. And there, of course, everyone is talking about the next launch of their, the new product and so forth. So when I would talk about customer retention, they would look at me with glassy eyes. So I thought if I could uh, research what's going on in innovation and combine that with what's going on in customer loyalty, how, uh, how might that be a door opener to catching people's attention and uh, growing my business? So, How did you come to the realization you know, that the concept of customer experience and retention might be overlooked in Silicon Valley's, you know, focus on innovation and new products and services. Well, yeah, it's always, you know, the the better mousetrap is going to be your ticket to success. And uh, at a certain point, you reach kind of a commoditization period uh, where competitors are very strong. You don't really have that much differentiation except for the experience itself. Or you're trying to figure out how to be more efficient. Uh, This actually happened at Applied Materials, even though they were twice as big as their next competitor. That was the company I was working at in the semiconductors. And this was, uh, I was hired there in 1994, and the year before this, the largest customer CEO said, I know we're always celebrating how much we buy from you, but I've got to be real frank. You are the uh, earliest to market with the latest technology all the time. 
And we have to have the latest technology as the biggest semiconductor company in the world, but we don't want to be buying from you if your competitors can beat you to it because you're really arrogant and hard to do business with. So we wondered how many other customers were feeling the same way, and uh, that's when they brought me in to run their annual customer relationship survey and drive a lot of change around the world. So I actually went to Ireland and many other countries in Europe and Asia to help them uh, get to the root of these issues and make some swift changes in our arrogance and ease of doing business. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure if it was in the book now or the, one of your blog posts where you kind of talk about um, Adobe's approach to involving everyone you know, in the organization in suggesting and implementing customer experience innovations. I was wondering, could you tell me a little bit about them really and, and how has their strategy you know impacted that their overall customer centric culture i think so you know, they set up uh, peer panels kind of like shark tank the tv show if you're familiar with that the, and uh, but i think it's a, a friendlier vibe so any employee can suggest some kind of innovation it doesn't have to be a product innovation it can be anything about the experience i i believe uh, but what the, the peer panel does is they put it in an incubator if it, they feel like it has merit, and then they f kind of nurture and fast track the uh, agile process, getting feedback from customers and prototyping and getting it out into the market or rolling it out in whatever way. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, one of the other things I loved about Adobe uh, which I learned from my podcasts and, uh, you know, networking over there. Uh, they had an immersion uh, series of workshops where employees would pretend like they were not a, an employee. They would pretend like they're a customer and they were given some kind of scenario, a real life type of dilemma that customers were uh, struggling with. So it could be something about billing. It could be something about finding information or, uh, using the software or whatever. And they were challenged to try to figure it out without their insider knowledge. So what happened was the employees got really, uh, you know, kind of passionate about these things and carried on the improvements after these workshops. So I think that these types of efforts are really great examples for any company to adopt. I was just imagining the Shark Tank music earlier there of employees coming in and the music playing as they walk down the, the, the hallway into the yeah, tank. Probably um, it wasn't quite that <laughs> dramatic, but that would be a nice flair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also mentioned, um, uh, you know, before I, I've heard you talk about the kind of the importance of adopting a, um, a blue ocean strategy and kind of understanding customers like their ultimate aims and expectations across their entire journey. And um, like, how can companies practically apply this approach to better align their businesses with their customers' needs and desires? Yeah, so the blue ocean concept is that we're usually competing in a red ocean where we're in price competition and direct competition with our uh, industry players. But if you step back and think, of how customers view things, step into their shoes. They may not view their alternatives only as your industry players. They may uh, see their alternatives as something wider. Uh, they may have unmet needs uh, adjacent to or associated with, and so usually your strategic planning group is uh, figuring those things out. But if you can focus on uh, those unmet needs where your competitors aren't playing, that's a wide open opportunity, a blue ocean. Uh, so I've found that concept to be really useful in customer experience work because usually a company is quite product oriented, uh, financially driven and competitor centric. <laughs> <laughs> so to, you know, to combat that, you need to help uh, employees and managers everywhere, non customer facing, you know, even procurement, legal, it, there's no holds barred. Every single employee and, and partner needs to be shifting their ideas to how does the customer view things? And then you find that you have a lot less waste. 
Okay, I suppose what about customer personas? You know, I suppose they're they're commonly used to understand and target specific customer segments. Um, but I, I suppose how do you define that? How would you define them? Well, I actually, um, in the course of this this research and uh, you know things that I was hearing in Silicon Valley, uh, started to understand this idea of jobs to be done. So, a customer's job to be done is not necessarily the functional uh, task that they are doing or what they're doing in the interaction with you. It's more about their purpose. Why are they buying your stuff in the first place? Are they trying to be more uh, capable, more timely, more, uh, you know, have their life simplified or enriched in some way, to relax, to avoid risk? When you understand what is the natural purpose for, you know, this group and that group and that group, let it surface. Don't don't put arbitrary bounds on it or labels of any sort. Let go of all your previous segmentation ideas and, and see what bubbles up from customers' comments. How are they talking? So usually you can use your customer service uh, comments that you record, uh, written or, or uh, audio or whatever, to mine that and find these, these groups. So the idea is that when you understand what their ultimate purpose is, then you can create segments of customers that have more natural uh, groupings. And the whole idea of business really is to meet or exceed expectations better than your competitors do, and then you're going to win the market share and, and share of wallet. So why are we segmenting customers and uh, organizing our strategic planning and our innovations and our uh, efficiencies on anything besides what are the expectations of each group. And when you have that real clear for everybody, it makes everything so much more more easy. You're going you're gonna to succeed a lot faster and uh, higher with your innovations as well as running the business. I love that. So it really simplifies the customer understanding process. Yeah, but very few people do it. Um, I was able to do it for a company where they had about a dozen uh, segments and all for good reason, you know, luxury, industrial, uh, and so on. And when we looked at what was the natural breakout of expectations in the comments, we found that there were actually only two camps for that brand. So I'm a firm believer that each brand has only two to four overall uh, purposes that their customers buy. And when you do that uh, persona based on that expectation, you're really looking at what are, their, what are the things that are showstoppers and, uh, and inhibitors, what's in, in it for them, what are the consequences to them and time worry, money, uh, you know, reputation, whatever. Uh, and then you overlay your journey map moments of truth onto that persona. So it's a very rich persona. When you share those two to four personas with your non-customer facing groups, that's easy for them to digest because it's only two to four, not 12, right? And then they, what we found was like simplicity was a, an overarching theme for one, and then timeliness was for the other. Everyone cared about simplicity and timeliness, you know, globally, but there were very specific reasons why timeliness was so important and such a, a showstopper for this one group, and simplicity was a showstopper for the other group. Uh, so I think that that helps drive customer centricity and so much more value in a company when everyone can think daily, is this decision we're making or this handoff I'm doing going to help or hinder our simplicity for our customers? Will it help or hinder timeliness for our customers? If you treat your internal customers the way that you know that your external customers want to be treated, then you're going to have that congruent con congruence in who you are internally and who you're trying to be externally. And it puts a lot less pressure on the customer facing groups and touch points. 
we mentioned a few companies earlier, but I suppose engaging customers and building trust are essential elements of a successful customer experience strategy. And could you give me some examples of companies that have really excelled in earning their customers' trust? Um, you know, and how they've been able to leverage that trust, you know, to build these lasting relationships and loyalty. Well, um, I think that trust is uh, is demonstrating that you have the other party's best interests at heart and uh, being watchful that for anything that you say or do that might give the impression otherwise. Um, and of course, having a certain amount of credibility and reliability that you do what you, you say. So uh, one uh, company that comes to mind is actually in the like air conditioning and uh, heating area. Uh, so they came to my house and they, you know, were very organized. They were very uh, considerate uh, on every level. They had thought through in advance everything that might be my reaction or concern and they're very proactive about things. And uh, it seemed like the left hand know what the right hand was doing much more than I've experienced with that kind of company or even companies in general. <laughs> So uh, that's one that, it, that uh, comes to mind. Um, and that reminds me, too, of a conversation I had just a couple years ago. We had uh, someone from the Ritz-Carlton who had been there like 25 years speak at our local uh, customer experience networking group. And she said that as much as it's well known that the customer-facing people have you know, a high standard to understand specific customer interests and needs and to be very responsive. It's not as well known, but it is equally emphasized that people in IT, legal, facilities, every place uh, doesn't have to do be touching the customer at all, need to have that same level of interest and um, responsiveness to internal customers as well as the overall customer profiles. So mm -hmm. I think that that is a real good example of being, uh, you know, having high integrity as a brand, that you're not just yes. putting on a, a surface layer of here's how we want to be presentable or to, uh, to be known as, but you are that through and through. And um, what for you, I suppose, what, what would you say is the biggest thing that causes customer churn? Yeah, so I think that it starts out, I don't know if it's the biggest thing, but I think that it's a very overlooked and uh, nobody's talking about it, uh, is identifying who is your target segment, your top target, who is your ideal customer profile. Now, the reason I bring this up is um, if you start off with a group that has certain expectations that are not really suited to your operational sweet spot, then you're always going to be having a lot of extra burdens on uh, service and refunds and returns and negative word of mouth and churn. And you're wondering why is that happening? Uh, so it was just a misfit from the beginning. And then of course the second step in getting it right is setting those expectations now, I've been a customer to many, many companies, as, as everybody has, and sometimes what I heard from the service or the salespeople didn't really pan out, right? Um, whether I misinterpreted it or not, um, it just wasn't true. <laughs> and so that became a factor in, um, you know, everything else. So that is something that we don't really include on in our metrics. Nobody's really watching it seems like no one cares, but my goodness, it's very fundamental. It affects everything. So uh, that, and then I think that if you do a dispositioning report for service or for a survey of, of any type, relationship survey or whatever, you'd likely find that at least 50% of the originators of issues to customers are not customer facing. And this is why I'm a huge fan of engaging the non-customer facing groups. It's always been a uh, part of my career since the very beginning. 
And it was a huge emphasis, of course, when I was in the semiconductor company for, for 11 years. And um, it's why I've created a community that actually helps uh, customer management people, service, success, mm -hmm. uh, experience management, also partner experience, and marketing people to learn how to influence this type of uh, engagement across the company to get to the root of it. Um, just before we wrap up, I I'd love to get your thoughts on AI and customer experience and, and where you think those things, you know, or how you think th those two uh, elements come together. Yeah, so AI is definitely going to help us in many ways, but I think that we always have inflated ideas about technology and it never really pans out to exactly what we hoped it would be. Um, that's been the case ever since CRM came along in the mid to late 90s and pretty much derailed all the total quality management uh, effort. Uh, customer experience just took on an experiential marketing type of, of thing and now like, would you recommend us and let me tell you, uh, give, me a, give me a 10. It's all just meaningless when you get, get to that point. So one thing to remember with AI and machine learning um, is that it's based on what information is available, right? So there's big data that is being pulled from, and if you're using it in your company, you're really missing out if you're not including in your big data the text mining and uh, voice mining, video mining, or whatever of your service calls and anything else that your customers are giving you because you have to expand your pool to actually, you know, as the maximum amount of uh, inputs in order for it to be accurate. So one of the dangers for artificial intelligence is actually that the intelligence will be artificial because it might not be based on a full set of, of information. And then the other uh, thing that I think about uh, AI is to make sure that we're balancing the effort of any kind of technology endeavor with cultural to about a 50-50 degree or maybe more on cultural. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, a vice president at Clorox when he was interviewed in a podcast at Salesforce. He said, we were trying to be digital, to do digital, but we realized we needed to be digital. <laughs> And I take that to mean that they, they needed to ha know what the right hand and the left hand were doing among people, even more so since they were setting up uh, technology to, to do it on their behalf. They had to have that continuity and collaboration internally in order to make it happen technologically. Um, and then lastly, just where can people go to keep up with you and your work? Yeah, LinkedIn is really the best place probably. Um, so Lynn Hunsaker, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, of course, clearaction.com is a direct source. So that's two words made into one, clearaction.com. Perfect. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really glad to have talked with you and uh, appreciate the opportunity. See you around.